morning. There's uh, no way that I could do Mr. Pratt justice by trying to introduce him and his background. Uh, the issue that he's going to speak about today is an issue that has been a topic of discussion with this group since I've been involved for the last 14 years. Our federal partners are in the room and they're always in the room with us and thank you for being here this morning. He's going to provide us information, he's going to provide us some history. Uh, I think you'll find it entertaining, but I think you'll find it extremely informative. I know in this audience we have people with different viewpoints. I'm glad you're here. We all pledge to uphold the Constitution and the encroachments upon it happened before we were born. These occupations are good and honorable, but how do we restore liberty and land? How do we restore peace and sanity to good government? Work together. BLM, Forest Service, any government agency that's represented in here, sheriffs, work together. So what shall we do? I don't know. I can't tell you what to do. I just know that I have spent five months trying to understand jurisdiction, and I finally got my mind around it. Hmm. Were today's public lands purchased by the consent of the legislature of the states? When I was a boy, the United States Forest Service was our best friend. Now the Forest Service and BLM are our worst enemies. Sheriff Palmer asked the similar question. He said, where does the Forest Service get its constitutional authority to have law enforcement officers within Grant County? Clarence Thomas. There are really only two ways to interpret the Constitution. Try to discern as best we can what the framers intended, or just make it up. The sovereign states and subdivisions are duty bound. They're going to draw a line, and in 1798, they called this interposition, to interpose. I hopefully you won't be offended by anything I said. Bound by oath to uphold and defend this Constitution and the Constitution of the state that you live in, that you're working in. And maybe we'll all come together, the sheriffs, the federal employees, and find a harmonious solution to our problem. The state governments are to protect the union of states from encroachments of the federal government. The state governments are to protect. We call this interposition. A peaceful way to try and take a check and balance on a federal rule or regulation or law or Supreme Court decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Part two, the Claus family martyred. Now I tried to think, what should I name this part? We introduced you to the Claus family that seven clauses in the Constitution that pertain directly to jurisdiction. We introduced those, and now we'll go through each clause and try to show what happened to it. And martyred usually is associated with liberty or something spiritual, something from the Bible. We have martyrs, and I thought, what can I call, call this? The clause family is not people. It's clauses of the Constitution. But the Constitution is a document of liberty. And in the Bible, we find statements about liberty that are very spiritual. And so I thought, I'm going to call this martyred. It's a Bible word. We're murdering liberty. And that's where I got the word for this section. The Constitution is a written instrument. As such, its meaning does not alter. That which it meant when it was adopted, it means now. Supreme Court, 1905. That's the position I take and believe in. The Constitution was written to be understood by the voters. 
Its words and phrases were used in their normal and ordinary meaning. Supreme Court, 1931. So it's not written in legalese that's hard to understand. It's written in basic English so we can understand it. And to help us with that, one of the contemporaries of our founding fathers was Noah Webster. And he wrote a dictionary and published it in 1828, defining all of the words of the Constitution so we can see what they meant in the day they were written. One of those words is engagement. Engagement means obligation by agreement or contract. They wrote that into the Constitution and that's an important clause. We call it the engagement clause. All engagements entered into before the adoption of this Constitution shall be as valid against the United States under this Constitution as under the Confederation. So all the engagements, all the agreements, all the contracts and clauses that came before the Constitution will be just as valid as if they were written into the document. In Article 9 of the Articles of Confederation, we have an engagement. No state shall be deprived of territory for the benefit of the United States. That's an engagement, and it's just as valid as if it were written into the Constitution. Formation of a more perfect union does not absolve that union of prior engagements, including those obligations established by the Resolution of 1780 and the Articles of Confederation. The Supreme Court seemed to understand the original intent of the engagement clause, and in 1823 they made it clear of what their position is. And the vacant soil is to be disposed of by that organ of the government which has the constitutional power to dispose of the national domain. In 1856, they still seemed to understand the engagements clause. On California's admission into the Union, she became the owner of all public land not disposed of by the law of Congress. Some of the public land had been disposed of by homestead and other methods. The sovereign states in 1788 looked like this. They wrote a constitutional contract, and because it was a contract between states, they called it a compact. And because the compact constituted our plan of government, they called it our constitution. This is where the word comes from. That's right out of Webster's Dictionary. The compact between the states was a list of delegated powers, few and defined, not numerous, not surrendered, not many, but few and defined, written in a list, and part of the contract established an agent they called the federal government. And this contract is called the federal constitution. That's what they called it. Our government system is established by compact, not between the government of the United States and the state governments, but between the states as sovereign communities, James Madison, the father of the Constitution, wrote. Hamilton, Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian are two words that were coined rather early in our history. They represented two different viewpoints. Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian are contending forces. On the 4th of July, we praise Jefferson but we live in Hamilton's world. Most people never mention Hamilton on the 4th of July, don't even think about him. And yet all around us we have Hamilton's nationalist world in order. If we put them on the screen as two men butting heads, that would be appropriate. Alexander Hamilton wrote, the greatest man who ever lived was Julius Caesar. Well now if he believes that, maybe we should use Augustus Caesar's symbol of Roman power as the symbol to represent Hamiltonian, a powerful central government bound together by coercion if necessary. On the other hand, we'll let the heads of Hengist and Horsa, Anglo-Saxon guardians of freedom, represent Thomas Jefferson. Summary, sovereignty is possession of the highest power. It is impossible for both the states and federal government to possess the highest power at the same time. When the sovereign states created the Constitution, they delegated a few enumerated powers to the new agent called the federal government. They delegated a few enumerated powers to the new agent. 
they did not surrender many of their powers to the new federal government. George Bancroft, a very respected historian in American history, lived a long and healthy life. And if any of you guys think you're too old, <laughs> he was 86 when he finally decided to get out and do something again. He wasn't going to quit. At age 86, he observed the Supreme Court's decision in Juilliard versus Greenman. He observed eight judges making a choice, and the majority opinion was expressed, and it was wrong in Bancroft's opinion. And so this great historian went to the labor of doing all of the documentation to document and show why those eight judges didn't know what they were talking about. And you can Google it up, and you can read the whole case. This is, this is good reading. You can read George Bancroft's opinion. A plea for the Constitution of the United States wounded in the house of its guardians in 1886. He wrote, the government of the United States is far, very far removed from the powers of a sovereign state. With other words, there's no such thing as national sovereignty. And he explains that in detail. Now that's quite different than what you were taught when you went to high school or college. It just happens to be the story of America that has been neglected. Daniel and Noah didn't agree with each other. These were cousins. One was 17 years older than the other, Noah being the oldest. Noah Webster wrote his dictionary and he defined sovereignty. Supreme in power, the possession of the highest power. On the other hand, the consolidationists, those people that called themselves nationalists, they had this definition. Sovereignty is the sum of all rights and powers. Now those definitions are not the same. This is a nationalist definition, and this is a states' rights definition. The consolidating school, they called themselves that. These were the nationalists. They actually had an organized think tank, Daniel Webster, Joseph Story, Nathan Dane, and a long list of dignitaries and high leading professionals. They called themselves the Consolidating School, or the Massachusetts School. And in the Massachusetts School, they had a certain set of beliefs. Sovereignty is the sum of all rights and powers. In the Constitution, sovereignty is delegated to the central government, which is an irrevocable ceding of power. Now, delegation and ceding are two different things. And so they're contradicting themselves in their own statement. This is the nationalist position. They call themselves the consolidating school. Their beliefs continue. States have sovereignty, except so far as they have ceded it. Today, this nationalist view is called dual sovereignty. And this is the best explanation I've found is by going back to these old timers that made this decision how to explain sovereignty. John Taylor of Caroline had a different perspective. He was one of the people that believed in states' rights. He wrote a book, New Views of the Constitution. It's good reading. It's still in print, readily available. New Views of the Constitution in 1823, he wrote. The consolidating school contends that we have two sovereignties, but that one is sovereign over the other. Mr. Hamilton, that we have coordinate sovereignties, but that one is made superlative. In the federal court in 1997, United States versus Gardner, the court decided the state government and the federal government exercise concurrent jurisdiction over the land. If we read this explanation from John Taylor of Caroline, once again, and ponder concurrent jurisdiction over the land, I believe this is the best definition that I've seen of concurrent jurisdiction. The consolidating school contends that we have two sovereignties, but that one is sovereign over the other. Mr. Hamilton, that we have coordinate sovereignties, but that one is made superlative. This is concurrent jurisdiction. The state is subordinate to the federal. In a newspaper article in 1788, Hamilton and, and uh, Madison and John Jay wrote a series of newspaper articles explaining the original meaning of the Constitution. In this newspaper article, he wrote, Imperium Imperio is a political monster. Now that's supposed to mean, since I don't know Latin, translated, 
A sovereign within a sovereign is a political monster. Now, I'm a school teacher, and I'm looking for visual aids, and I'm trying to think, how do we teach a sovereign within a sovereign is a political monster? And I Googled up monster images, and this is what I got. I have here the Department of Interior. I chose an octopus with tentacles, reaching out, taking hold of every state, tugging and pulling and twisting and tweaking. Could that be what Alexander Hamilton had in mind? In the case of Kleppe, for example, we get the concept. The monster declares, I have complete legislative power without limitation over federal lands. Does he? Is it a monster? How does this work? In FLIPMA, we find this concept. In my discretion, I will offer contracts to state and local enforcement officials to enforce federal laws and regulations on public lands. Is this how it's supposed to work? In the discretion of the concurrent jurisdiction concept? Googling again, monsters, let's let this one represent the feds. With their outspoken opinion, you states don't forget the supremacy clause. We are more sovereign than you are. Back to this concept of dual sovereignty. The Constitution provides a list, a few undefined things the federal government may do. They're specific, coin money, declare war, raise armies, punish piracies, etc. In the Bill of Rights, Article 10, it includes this warning. Now, I paraphrase it, of course. Warning to the federal public servants. If it is not on the list, you cannot do it. That's the 10th article of the Bill of Rights. If it's not there, you can't do it. Your powers are few and defined. They're enumerated. They are definite. They're listed. Delegated powers are not sovereign. They are not sovereignty. They are simply the powers the sovereign states delegated, loaned to their agent, the federal government. Do not confuse sovereignty with the powers which the sovereign delegates. Remember, the sovereign states wrote a contract between themselves and ratified it. The contract is a list of delegated powers that they gave to their agent, the federal government. The federal government is the servant of the states. But this raises the question, what if the agent does something that is not on the list? What do we do then as citizens of the local counties and states? What if the agent does something that's not on the list? In 1798, this problem arose. The Alien and Sedition Acts were passed. The President of the United States signed them. Clearly, blatantly, portion of it was unconstitutional. What were the people to do when the federal government and the president did something that was not on the list? And so Thomas Jefferson and James Madison addressed the issue. Thomas Jefferson went to the state legislature of Kentucky. James Madison worked with the state legislature of Virginia. And they eventually passed what became known famously as the Resolutions of 98. Now, these are worth reading. There's good material, good history. This is a portion of it. Now, bear with me. Try it out here. This is from the Resolutions of 98 that this assembly doth explicitly and preemptorily declare that it views the powers of the federal government as resulting from the compact to which the states are parties, as limited by the plain sense and intention of the instrument constituting that compact, as no further valid than they are authorized by the grants enumerated in that compact, and that in case of a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by the said compact, the states, who are parties thereto, have a right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of the evil. Okay, there's a compact between the states, and if the federal government operates outside the compact, the states are duty bound to interpose. That's a peaceful thing. It's a peaceful way to try and bring about a balance again where there was a violation of the trust. The sovereign states and subdivisions are duty bound. So let's put up our symbols here. They're going to draw a line. And in 1798, they called this interposition, to interpose, interposition. 
In our state, we have 29 sheriffs. We have a state legislature, a governor, and a judicial system that belong to our state under our constitution, uh, the state constitution, which we all swore an oath to uphold. And you did in your state. You swore an oath to uphold the federal constitution and the constitution of your state. All of these people have a responsibility to interpose when there is a violation of the compact. It is a peaceful way of trying to restore constitutional government again. The federal courts have held that the power to declare federal laws unconstitutional lies with them. Now, when I read this statement, I thought, you know, that reminds me of the old saying about the fox guarding the chicken house. If the federal courts think they can tell us what the Constitution means, what check and balance do we have on the federal courts? We are the living Constitution. You've heard this, I hope. I mean, I wish you hadn't heard it, but we probably all have. We are the living Constitution. That's a direct quote from one of the justices, probably more than one. What we say is what the Constitution means. Hmm. They said that interposition is an illegal defiance of constitutional authority. What else would you expect them to say? Correction, please. State government has a responsibility. Interposition is a peaceful defiance of illegal, unconstitutional authority. When the legislative, executive, and judicial branches have betrayed us, the states must draw the line as sentinels of the liberties of the people. This first happened in 1809. The state of Massachusetts, and it's almost laughable. Guess who the president of the United States is when they decide to draw the line? It's Thomas Jefferson. He and Congress decided to pass an act called the Embargo Act that they thought would help the country. It was in their best, you know, they thought this is the best they could do. The president signed it. And the state of Massachusetts and others said, that's unconstitutional. You can't do that even if you are Thomas Jefferson. And so the state legislature of Massachusetts in 1809 voted the Embargo Act is unconstitutional and not legally binding on the citizens of this state. And they drew the line. They called it nullification. Now this again, right out of the 1798 resolutions, these terms are old terms but we need to review and see what happened back then. So the state of Massachusetts nullified a federal law that they felt was unconstitutional. And today the Supreme Court says, you can't do that. Well, who is the check and balance on violations of the Constitution and how do we do it peacefully? This man did a splendid job of writing this up in this book. 2010, fine scholar. Historian Thomas Woods wrote nullification how to resist federal tyranny in the 21st century. What it is is a history of the resolutions of 1798, and it's worthy of reading. In fact, we handed them out at the State Sheriff's Convention in Utah last month. Every sheriff should have received one. I handed a copy to my old friend, Ed Phillips. By the way, I went through these slides with him to see what he thought of them, and we discussed them in detail. Now, many of you know Ed Phillips. He helped you to found the early organization of the Western Sheriffs. He was the president for a time. I took the book to him about a month ago. And I said, Ed, read this and give me your opinion. Well, about two weeks later, I called him up, and he was just bubbling with enthusiasm. Right? He did enjoy the read. I said, Ed, just give me one sentence, one sentence that I can share down in Las Vegas. And he blurted out, I wish to hell that I'd had this book in my hands 20 years ago when we started the Western Sheriff's Association. <laughs> that was one sheriff's opinion. It's got some value to look at these old principles from the past. The jurisdiction clause family has a clause member called guarantee. The guarantee clause. Article 4, Section 4. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. Now, that's a really important clause for jurisdiction, that guarantee. Each state shall be a republic. That's what we're guaranteed. That's when the Utah legislature one year ago passed this, this law, we are a compound constitutional republic. Each state is. 
We need to consider the principle of constitutional uniformity. If each state is to be a republic, we need to be equal in the style and kind of republics that we are. Well, really? What kind of a republic are we to be? Take, for example, are we a socialist republic? A socialist republic, the fundamental element of a socialist republic is government ownership or control of all land. That's the basic element of a socialist republic. Or perhaps we ought to be an aristocratic republic where a few of the wealthy individuals take the leadership positions and run the government. Or maybe we ought to be a banana republic where the crafty and deceitful and corrupt run the government. Or maybe we should be the republic. But what is the republic? Did you all take a pledge sometime in the last year or two and pledge to the republic? What does that mean? Well, our founding documents define what it means. The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, more than 6,000 words describing in detail what the republic is that we pledge to. Expert witness James Madison described the republic in these terms. In the compound republic of America, we are a compound constitutional republic. And because we're together, we make up a republic of republics. This is a great book. It's one of the finest books I've read in the last 20 years. Written in 1878. It's 500, 606 pages of fine print with no pictures. It's good reading. And he calls America the Republic of Republics. And that's very descriptive. This is a, a map of federal land ownership. It's an old map. There would be more black on it now. As I understand, the ownership of land increased, not decreased, since this map was created. On the right-hand side, we see the eastern half of the United States. The black on the map represents federal land owned or claimed ownership. So the white is the state and the private land. And these areas of black over here, I understand, weren't admitted or purchased until after the year 1911. So had we seen this map before 1911, this area over here would be basically white because federal ownership was so small the tiny little segments wouldn't hardly show on the map. So the question is, who owns the West? Now, that's not too hard to answer, is it? Who owns the West? Who claims ownership? In Kleppe and Flipma. The constitutional requirement to dispose of public land was abandoned. They were required by trust, by obligation, by constitutional requirement, and it was abandoned. In our republican form of government, at the time of statehood, the federal government relinquished jurisdiction and proprietary interest over the land with two exceptions, Indian lands and enclaves. To those exceptions, they had jurisdiction. The federal land ownership Equal footing doctrine comes in. And by the way, I've, I've read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages on this. I think I've read everything anybody can say for or against all of these issues I'm putting up here. And I'm given a very limited time to present the concepts. You'll have to go do your, your own reading. The equal footing doctrine, in essence, is this. Admission of new states on an equal footing with the original states in all respects, whatever. We won't let the states come in at different levels of equality. One is, one is more equal than the other. They're all going to come in on the same basis, was the original intent. Article 4, Clause 4, the Guarantee Clause, has been severely violated. Remember, in 1823, the Supreme Court correctly ex explained, and the vacant soil is to be disposed of by that organ of the government which has the constitutional power to dispose of the national domain. Law school. I had the enjoyable experience right at the break. Somebody in that room heard me speaking. And he came in here. And he said, I'm a lawyer. He said, I, I like what you're saying. <laughs> and we had a, a nice visit about law schools. Here's a, I went Google law schools. And you get all sorts of choices. Here, here's a big pre prestigious building. There's a law school. What do lawyers learn at law school? Well, they learned how to defend their clients. They learned the law. They study Supreme Court cases. They study history of law and back. 
Almost all lawyers that I ask, when I ask them this question, were you required to read the Constitution as part of the requirement for graduation? Almost all lawyers say no, that was never required. They didn't have to read the supreme law of the land. It wasn't a part of the course. But what did they study? We studied case law. I asked one lawyer, and he said to me, huh, Mr. Pratt, my professor told me that we should not read the Constitution. If we read the Constitution, it would be too confusing. And I now know why. Because if you read the Supreme Court cases and then you read the Constitution, it is confusing. Because they don't jive much of the time. Well, so I put the quotation up here. The professor is telling his students, don't read the Constitution, it's too confusing. Here we study case law. Now the best I can determine, this is how that works. In the United States versus, and I don't know how to pronounce the name, so I'm going to say gratiat, and you can tell me afterwards what you think the correct pronunciation is. So in the United States versus Gratiot in 1840, they wrote, and this power over the territorial lands is vested in Congress without limitation. And it has been considered the foundation upon which the territorial governments rest. So Congress has power to make rules and regulations over the territorial governments without limitation. That's what they decided in Gratiot in 1840. Well, we study case law. And so United States versus San Francisco, on down to the present day, we have, oh, by the way, the, the, the period right in here, or the comma, see it right here? We're going to relate to this comma in just a moment. So the later court discussed the cases in case study and in Kleppe versus New Mexico, claiming that they were following the earlier cases by stare decisis, following the original precedent, they, they wrote this. We have repeatedly observed that the power over the public lands thus entrusted to Congress is without limitation. Now they claimed they were following gratiat, but they took out the comma, put in a period, threw half the sentence away, and completely changed the meaning. This is called case law that they're studying following the precedent. So here's the period. Gratiot in 1840, Congress has unlimited power over pre-statehood territorial lands. And yet in Kleppe, Congress has unlimited power over public lands within a state. Totally different meaning, and they claim that's following stare decisis. That ought to return on a red light as we see this kind of changes taking place. Jurisdiction clause family the property clause. Now, I got children when I put these silhouettes on there. You notice that's children. Now, they're abused. And you think about the abuse of children in your county, this is just as bad of abuse of our freedom and our liberty as they abused the property clause. And it's been going on for more than 100 years. August the 30th, 1787, they were discuss discussing territorial claims. Now, these are notes of the Federal Convention that you can read. They were discussing territorial claims. They were well aware, since some of these men had been on the Congress, or at the Congress, and these men had passed the resolution of 1780, they were very aware of its content and its meaning. They discussed these things under territorial claims. The resolution of 1780 formed the basis upon which Congress was required to dispose of territorial and public lands. They discussed Article 9 of the Articles of Confederation. No state shall be deprived of territory for the benefit of the United States. Just other state land session compacts. Collectively, these were called the trust compacts or engagements in the engagements clause. At this point in the discussion, it was determined it would be best to leave everything on that subject in statu quo. Now, today we say status quo, but they spelled S-T-A-U in the original notes. It would be best if we left everything in status quo. We will leave these engagements as they are. The trust compacts will continue to function, and we will write an engagements clause which incorporates them into the Constitution. At that point in the discussion that day, Governor Morris said, I make a motion. See, this is how they proceed. He makes a motion now for a property clause following all of this debate. And his motion was accepted with one word change. This was legislature in the first, in his motion, 
and they eventually changed this word to Congress, which means very much the same thing. Now, this was his motion. You'll see in a few minutes that this was not a good motion, but it, it was still the one that passed. Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. Okay, that's called the property clause. Now, in prop the property clause in untampered, we're going to find out it was tampered with, in untampered plain English, this was the original intent. When a territory becomes a state, Congress shall have power to make all needful rules and regulations to dispose of former territorial lands and other property in an orderly manner. That's all it was, a disposal clause. It was delegating to Congress the power to dispose of the property after the, after the state joined the Union in a peaceful and orderly manner. They seemed to understand that in the Supreme Court as late as 1850 when they wrote in the case of Benner versus Porter, we are satisfied that the act of Congress admitting the territory of Florida as a state into the Union displaced the territorial government and abrogated all its powers and jurisdiction. When Florida became a state, the federal government no longer had any jurisdiction. Now, if you don't like the way that's worded, they said it again in the same case. I guess they really wanted to get the point across. So they write again in that same case. The territorial government was displaced, abrogated, every part of it, and that no power of jurisdiction existed within her limits except that derived from the state authority. Hmm. Jurisdiction clause family, enclave. The enclave clause reads, Congress shall have power to exercise exclusive legislation over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state, in which the same shall be for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. This is a delegated power to Congress called the Enclave Clause. Hmm. Were today's public lands purchased by the consent of the legislature of the states? Were they? No. Well, well, but Mr. Pratt, just a minute, just a minute now. You can't do that. That's not. So the lawyers, the attorneys tell me, you can't. That's not the way it reads. But just a minute. The enclave clause said that you had to do it that way. This is a fundamental principle that I wrote down. This is my opinion after reading all this, sorting through all this pile of material. By the Constitution, only the states can create parks, forest reserves, wildlife refuges, monuments, etc. The federal government may hold no land in a state for non-constitutional purposes. I mean, that's all I can conclude after reading hundreds of pages on the subject. Oh, just a minute, though, the federal attorney says. And I'm collecting two attorneys' viewpoints here, and I respect them both highly. Amanda Marshall and Kenneth Power wrote, and I hope he's here today, they wrote these, some of these phrases pertaining to that line of thinking. Amanda Marshall, incorrect, 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 misguided. Property clause, property clause, property clause, supremacy clause, numerous court decisions, federal laws, and the bottom line was no, cons no state consent is necessary. We don't need state consent anymore. That's a thing of the past because of the supremacy clause and the property clause and all these various Supreme Court rulings and federal enactments. Hmm. I had to ponder on that one. Quoting directly from the summary of Attorney Dickens of the January 12th meeting, there are many U.S. Supreme Court cases going back over 100 years where the court has found that Congress has broad authority under the property clause. So we'll go back over 100 years, they have broad authority under the property clause. They don't need the consent anymore. Supreme Court precedent for the past 100 years is clear. Under the property clause, Congress may delegate rulemaking authority to the federal agencies that was written in Attorney Marshall's statement, and under Attorney Power's statement, authority of the Secretary of Agriculture recognized over 100 years. Property clause, property clause. 20 times he invokes the property clause, very important clause. Each of these want to tell us that it happened 100 years ago or more, and apparently that lends it credibility. What if we go back 200 years? Do they say the same thing then? 
Let's try to understand this with visual aids like a teacher would present. I selected a fort, a mighty fortress. And I thought, let's make this fortress represent the constitutional fortress. Okay, our founding fathers wanted to provide a land of liberty. They had gone through some pretty difficult times with the oppressions of King George and the form of government that was imposed upon them. And so they wrote a constitution. They hoped it would be like Thomas Jefferson said, like a chain. <laughs> We're going to bind them down from mischief with the chains of the Constitution. I thought, let's, let's liken it to a fort. So we're going to have the constitutional fortress. And out in front, we're going to put the, the jurisdiction clause family. And they're going to protect the front gate of the fort. They're going to protect the jurisdiction as it was originally intended in the Constitution of 1789. Now, the nationalists began assault immediately. The fort mortar had hardly dried. <laughs> and they were in there trying to encroach on the system of, the, of liberty. So here in the early days, almost in the beginning, they began to misconstrue the property clause well over a hundred years ago. And it, be, it became a battering ram. They began to misconstrue the supremacy clause. And it likewise was used as a battering ram. They knocked down the jurisdiction clause family. They broke into the fort. And they've been raising havoc ever since. And so the attorneys correctly and wisely, intellectually correctly, they state it happened more than 100 years ago. Yes, that's right. It did. The property clause provides separate. By the way, this is the finest paper I have read on the subject by Kenneth Power. It's the finest paper I've read explaining the position of the Forest Service and the federal government with regard to constitutional issues today. It's valuable, good reading. And I enjoyed it. I read it twice carefully. The property clause provides separate and independent authority for Congress to make rules respecting federal property without qualification or limitation. Under the supremacy clause, federal statutes enacted pursuant to the property clause preempt conflicting state laws. Problem, the wellspring of United States Forest Service and BLM power is judicial misconstruction of the property clause. If over a hundred years ago the property clause was misconstrued, then the whole basis of authority has been upset. This book does an excellent job of taking us back through that history. William Hayward, How the West Was Lost, The Theft and Usurpation of States' Property Rights, 446 pages of fine print with no pictures. Good reading. Thank you, William Hayward. He's still alive, I believe. I'd like to write him a letter and thank him for his numerous hours of effort in collecting this data. He wrote on page 384, in this case, Utah Power and Light versus the United States in 1917, in this case, as in all the others I have examined, federal land ownership was not decided. It was assumed. That's really important to understanding the history of our country. On page 149, he wrote, eight Supreme Court cases, and he lists them. Federal jurisdiction can only occur with the consent of the legislature of the state. So the court hasn't always said that consent didn't matter. There was a time when they said consent was required. Oh, we all have heard of George Orwell. Probably we were requ required to read him when we went to high school. <laughs> George Orwell's 1984. He wrote it in 1945. And he was going to tell what life would be in 1984. Well, you know, it's not too far off. We're in the year 2012 now, and we've accepted a lot of the thing. You know, remember, Big Brother is watching you. Big Brother was controlling everything, the central government. He wrote of Orwellian doublethink. Doublethink is when you can think two things are true, and they both contradict each other. Then this is true, and this is true, but they're completely Contradictory. Let's try that out. The enclave clause in plain English, which we're told is the way we have to look at the Constitution. State consent is necessary. It is necessary for the federal government to build a post office within a state. Now you can't read it any other way. Forts, dockyards, arsenals, magazines, and other needful buildings require the consent of the state legislature. So you have to have the consent of the legislature to build a post office in 18, 18, in 1789, get the right year there. On the other hand, the contemporary property clause, 
Contemporary, meaning the modern way of looking at the property clause, says no state consent is necessary for the federal government to establish 1.6 million acre national monument within a state. We don't need any state consent to tell Utah we're going to have a 1.6 million acre monument. Had they asked the state, what would have happened? Well, the state legislature would have voted no. But they don't ask the state because that's not required anymore. That should turn on a red light, a warning light. Fundamental rule of constitutional interpretation. An enumerated delegation of limited power will not be followed by a general grant of power. Cole versus the United States, 1875. More than 100 years ago, the Supreme Court began overturning property rights and consent. The consent of a state can never be a condition precedent to the exercise of federal power, they decided. Ten years later, in Leavenworth versus Lowe, the Cole decision, now this is a paraphrase, the Cole decision is good law, a doctrine authoritatively declared. Congress may exercise jurisdiction over the places it might acquire without state consent, provided that those places are used as a means to carry out the purposes of the government. So as far back as 1885, the court's saying, you don't need the consent of the state as long as the land is being used for the purposes of the government. The jurisdiction family, the property clause, Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. This could better have been called, or should be called today, the disposal clause. That's more descriptive of what the original intent is. It was the power to dispose. It was not the power not to dispose. They did not get the power not to dispose. They were required to dispose of the property. In plain English, when a territory becomes a state, Congress shall have power to make all needful rules and regulations to dispose of former territorial lands and other property in an orderly manner. That was the original intent. <laughs>